My name is Benny Sandon. I was born in Grainfield, Kansas in 1925 and uh, lived in Kansas uh, until I was, uh, well, until 1957 actually. I was in high school in a little town in, of, of Grinnell, Kansas and I was uh, probably a junior in high school. And, uh, but yeah, I, I don't remember a great deal of the happenings, but I remember that, yeah, I remember it, yes. The day before my first 10 weeks examinations in my senior year, a friend of mine and I uh, ditched school and went to the neighboring town and enlisted in the Navy. I guess I would have been 18. I was old enough, I guess, that I didn't need consent, and I didn't, I, we just decided on the spur of the moment to do it, and, and then I, I, that was, would have been in September, I guess, and then in November, I believe it was, I was, uh, I come to Denver and was sworn in here, and I did get into the Navy. At that time, it was pretty difficult. I went uh, to Farragut, Idaho, and uh, it was cold. It was in the winter. When I finished basics, I was able to come home for a couple of weeks, and I went back, and uh, they put me in an overflow camp, and we were cutting wood. At that time, all of Farragut was heated with wood and coal, and so they put us in a in a uh, kind of an overflow camp and we cut wood for <laughs> several weeks. It was fun, it was cold, but uh, we built a, the, with the wood we built a, a high shelter uh, like a maze and then we built a great big fire in the middle and so we'd go cut wood and then we'd come back and warm up and, and had plenty of coffee, so it wasn't bad. They sent me first of all to San Diego and it was going to training and school there, and then they put us through the the testing to decide what you were good at and so on. And and uh, uh, during that time, then they assigned me to small craft training, and then I went to San Pedro, and that's where we were taking the small craft training. And I ended up on a minesweeper, and uh, it, it was only 180 feet long. My ship was a. Uh, um, an auxiliary mine sweeper, and it was called the Spectre. Well, it was a small ship, you know, and uh, we had two engines, uh, two props, and so that gave us a little bit more. Yeah, it was maneuverable. It was called an AM, which was an auxiliary mine sweeper, meaning that it was a seagoing um, minesweeper rather than a yard minesweeper. They were about 90 feet long and they were wooden. They were a wooden ship, real small. And they were designed to sweep mines right in the harbor. Um, like, for example, Pearl Harbor. They, we had them there. Our mission, of course, was to sweep the mines in the, in the harbor and the outlying sea for the invasion forces. I think we had finished our small craft training um, and were just kind of at it. They didn't know what to do with us and our ship was being built, so they sent us to Seattle and we actually were housed um, on the grounds where the, where the ship was being built, at, at the shipyards. Uh, I think it was some barracks and stuff that was right there on the, on their own ground, so we had um, we had freedom to come and go. Um, we we weren't a, really attached to anything. We weren't in training, um, and so they were tickled to death for us to to learn more about the ship. So we could we were going back and forth from our barracks to the ship all the time, and we got to see you know put the engines in and. And for a guy that was going to be a deckhand, or a, 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 the, not the deck, but the, the bridge hand to see them put the mechanics together was, was interesting. 
And of course, I was a farmer and I knew all about mechanics and that sort of thing anyway, so that was interesting to me. That was fun. Yeah, while I was in San Diego, um, they selected me as a, as a sonar uh, applicant, I guess, and then sent me to uh, sonar school. And um, when we eventually commissioned the ship and I got aboard ship, I was doing both sonar and radar. Soon after we got aboard ship, um, we lost our sonar repairman. So the captain asked me and a friend of mine if we could do it, and so we did. So we did the, the maintenance as well as the operation on the sonar gear, which was kind of fun. Well, of course, the sonar is a system for detecting underwater submarines and, and other uh, obstacles and so on. Uh, and a radar, of course, was, was uh, the, the, the same sort of thing, but for surface aircraft and ships. And, and it's the same radar that we use nowadays for weather and everything else. So it hasn't changed much, except it got more sophisticated. I don't know who the lady was, but she smashed the champagne bottle and and we had the bands playing and everybody was all, you know, in dress clothes and yeah, it was it was impressive. Our complement was 109. We went to sea with 100 and uh, our captain was, uh, what do I want to say? He was a, he was a good judgment of character, I think. And uh, by the time we got to Iwo Jima, he had weeded out, I think, everybody that uh, he thought was not going to fit. Primarily, we were all from the west, uh, west of the Mississippi. Um, we had uh, uh, a guy from Connecticut, and we had a guy from New York. We had a guy from Georgia. But primarily, we were all from this part of the country. And um, a lot of us were farmers, um, you know, from, from, from the West. Um, yeah, and we knew everybody. Uh, because, you know, you're, you're on a ship 180 feet long, and you're there a couple of years. And we really had no problems. Um, we had a couple. We had a guy that hit another guy and broke his jaw and uh, well, got in the brig. But I can only remember a couple of guys that was ever put in the brig. Um, we just didn't have any personnel problems to speak of. They had their own problems. They were, they'd go on leave and get back late or some such a thing. But um, not any real conflicts between people. I'm sure there were people you didn't like as well as others, but um, we didn't have that kind of problem. It was also kind of unusual that th that group were aboard when we commissioned the ship, and the majority of us were still aboard when they decommissioned it after the war. Or not, maybe not when they actually decommissioned it, but we brought it back to the States and and brought it into Texas where it was going to be decommissioned. So we got to see both ends of it. We immediately went into um, the shakedown cruises and we did that um, out of Seattle. Uh, and then we left and we did everything we could do there. And then we left and went down to somewhere in California, maybe it was San Pedro again and did some special, uh, m some more shakedown, but some special training. We had a, <clears throat> there were several of us, by that I mean there were several of our squadron that was now, had been built, and uh, we had a submarine uh, attached to us, and we'd go out and, and do special training with this sub. I think they were kind of ready for us to, to, to get the whole squadron out. And uh, we were one of the earlier ones, I think. And I think there were 12 of us total um, in, our, in our squadron. And uh, as soon as we got all of those 
commissioned and shook down why we went pretty much as a group uh, first to Hawaii and spent, uh, I don't know, a week or so there with getting provisions and final shakedown and <clears throat> and they they did a what they call a degaussing procedure where they uh, would rid the ship of all magnetic fields and so on. Uh, so all of the the uh, compasses and everything would you know weren't influenced by its own magnetic. And then we went to Anawitok and was on our way to Iwo Jima. There really weren't too many of us um, because we'd sweep, we'd sweep areas, we would sweep an area and then move and then once in a while we'd have to come back because they would sneak out and plant a few more um, and we did come back uh, on occasion. But we had enough ships out there that we pretty much knew what they were what they were doing. We would be the earlier group of ships in. Um, the we would have uh, uh, support by the big ships because on some occasions they would even anchor, um, you know, several miles away, and then they would start bombarding the the island. Uh, particularly in the areas where the invasion was going to take place, we of course would would sweep. By that I mean we would go in and and cut the mine uh, anchors, and they would come to the surface, and then you could destroy them. We would we would sweep the mines in in along the harbor, or not a harbor, but all the way around the island, for that matter. And as we could get closer and closer, then our support ships, the, the smaller support ships like destroyers and, and those kind of ships would, would follow us. And uh, we'd just keep going in, making sweeping closer and closer to the shore. Maybe we started sweeping like a mile or a mile and a half out, and then we just kept sweeping in closer and closer. And there were some areas that we were within, you know, yards of the of the of the beach, and the and the rocks. If you give it any thought, that's the way it had to be. You had to clear the they had to clear the mines before the invasion come in. I mean, usually there were some battleships with us, uh, heavy cruisers, and they would be bombarding the the island while we were sweeping the mines along the, the coasts. And we got close enough that you could easily see the Japanese uh, moving around. Gee, I think you could have thrown a rock over to the rocks. They were reluctant to fire on us because when they did, one of our support ships would just they were so accurate they just knock out a gun and uh, so the Japanese soon learned that they they should not uh, <laughs> display themselves very much. As we would move around the island we would we would sweep we would sweep an area and as we'd move around the island uh, and we'd get into n new groups of course then they hadn't learned the lessons that the people on the other side of the island had, and, and of course they would fire on us. Um, they seemed like to us in those days, we felt like they weren't very accurate compared, compared to our people. The gunners on the destroyers were amazing, absolutely were amazing. They basically had five inch guns. Their, their long guns were five inch guns. Um, usually doubles. Um, each, uh, it seems to me like they had three turrets, as I recall. Uh, but they were, they were extremely accurate. And, uh, and of course the destroyer was fast too. They, I remember one occasion where a, a gun emplacement started firing and you could see the shell fall in the water 
uh, short of us, and then it got closer, and then finally the last one went over us. So it was that, you know, it was, they were zeroing in. But when that last one went over, the there was a destroyer that was kind of behind us, just aft of us, and he uh, accelerated and pulled around in front of us, and then all of a sudden that that gun emplacement just disappeared. It just the the just looked like it went right in the hole where that guy was was dug into, and of course that silenced that gun. Each time we'd move, um, we'd we'd have to put up with the same thing, and then it got to where when we'd work closer in. I remember when we moved clear on the opposite side, and I don't know east and west from there, there but there was an outcropping of, of rocks uh, out into the ocean that were just barely above water. And the Japanese had gun emplacements there, small, small arms, small ones. Our, we had a three inch gun f forward and as long as we were sweeping and we could train the the big gun on the on the shore, it was quiet. But as soon as we'd turned where the big gun couldn't fire, why then these guys would would raise up and start shooting with their rifles and anything else. And uh, it would it that only took place for a day or two because the, the, again the destroyers would just. <laughs> It, it, they just didn't dare uh, show themselves, you know. There were two types of mines. There were mines, they were all anchored to the bottom, to the, to the underneath on the bottom of the ocean. But there was a, a mechanical mine and a, a, a magnetic mine, and you had to handle them separately. We would stream two cables and we had paravanes that would guide the, the, uh, the, the cables out at an angle behind the ship. So each ship would go through the minefield and with these cables out, and they had a, a real high-tension steel saw blade attached to the cable, uh, and as, it, as the cable would drag across the the anchored cable, then it would cut those in two. And then, of course, the, the mine would pop up to the ocean, to the top. Uh, and then they either floated away, or for a period of time, a friend of mine and I were on a rifle squad that we would fire at them and, and, and blow them up. We were using 30 out 6 army rifles. Uh, and we were shooting them from, I suppose, 100 yards to 300 yards. And um, um, some of them, I think we would, uh, I think we'd actually, the shell would actually penetrate and then they would sink. But oftentimes uh, they would explode. And, uh, but we didn't do that very long. Um, and I can't remember us doing that at Iwo Jima. I think we were in Okinawa when we were doing that. The magnetic mines, on the other hand, were designed to be set off by the, uh, by the noise and the magnetic field of, of the ship that got close enough to them. And so we had a, a, a single long magnetic cable that was uh, uh, streamed way out behind us, so like, I don't know, maybe, uh, I don't know, 300 yards or 400 yards. And it had a magnetic field. It was set up with a magnetic field. It was an electronic, electric thing. And uh, when you got close enough, then it would just blow the mines. So that was the way we got rid of the, the, those. Um, we did, I, I don't know how we knew um, which mine was there, but sometimes we would we would sweep with one, and sometimes we'd sweep with the other. Well, you hoped you didn't hit one. Um, if you can imagine, um, what can I? 
If you can imagine a bunch of ships going through the water like a flock of geese in the sky with a V shape, one following the other, that's the way our, that's the way we, we proceeded through the water to, to cut the mines. The first ship um, had his uh, gear streamed and the next one would be um, just behind it and out to the side and doing the same thing. Uh, yeah, we had some really close calls. There were times when um, you'd make one sweep and you'd cut some mines and you'd go through that field and then you'd turn around, all of the ships would turn around and you had to go back through. And there were times when uh, the mines in that period of time has floated over into where you were going to make your next pass. And we can remember looking over the side and watching some go by on each side at the same time. Um, yeah, it was, yeah, that's what you did. You just went through them. I remember one incident where there were three mines that were right dead ahead of us. Um, and you could have, uh, when we went through them, and our, our, our captain was a, an amazing seaman. And I remember him on this incident going between two and then changing the speed of the engine so he could turn and miss the other one, and uh, you could almost have spit on the mines. I mean, they were, they were right. We were watching them as just looking over the side. It seemed like we were always on patrol, but it, 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 that was not fun duty because you had two points out in the ocean and you just went from one point to the other and back and forth. And you took whatever happened out there, whether it was wind or high seas or, or the enemy or whatever it was. So it was not fun. It seemed like we would be out for maybe a week, I would guess. Um, for a few days at least, and then we'd come back in, and of course we had provisions and water and that sort of thing to account for. And then maybe the next time, the next time we wouldn't go to the outer perimeter, we would stay in on in a closer patrol. And then of course you had the we had the uh, we'd, we would maneuver you know in close as well. But I, I can't remember um, how long we'd be out on those. Uh, it seemed like maybe a, a week or a few days. But we never did like it. In the South China Sea, there was a huge minefield out there. And we spent, I don't know, a month and a half sweeping what seemed to me to be out in the middle of the ocean. Uh, I suppose it was a I suppose it was a, uh, a sea lane of some kind that they had mined. The majority of them were planted around the islands as a protective measure. Um, I, am, I know of, of seeing some of them that would wash to the shore. And of course, all you have to do is knock over one of the ears, you know, and uh, then they would explode. Uh, we, have, we had seen them. Um, wash up against the rocks and then you'd hear or see an explosion over there. Um, so I doubt that there's any out there. Um, probably by now a lot of them had rusted and, and sunk and, and I doubt that they would be of any danger. But as I recall we didn't see uh, kamikazes in, in, in Iwo Jima. Um, we began seeing them in Okinawa, and as Okinawa progressed, we saw more and more and more of them. And um, uh, particularly when we had we had secured an air base, um, one air base on Okinawa, and then we and I don't know which little island. Then we moved around to a an island called Aishima, and 
secured that enough and got a uh, an air base there. And that, by the way, is when they brought in the the uh, P-57s. But <clears throat> while we were at Aishima is when we really saw a lot of kamikazes. And um, uh, we had one come to our ship and we shot it down. Uh, we had a sister ship that was hit and was sunk. And uh, uh, of course everybody was picking up survivors. And as I recall, many of the survivors went on to one of our sister ships and she took a, a plane the next day. Uh, so they, they really had it tough. We didn't. I have always had a little bit of ESP. Um, um, we had a Japanese plane come in um, and of course uh, we were just outside of of uh, Buckner Bay, which is a, which became famous because that's where we were taking all of our damaged ships. It was a boneyard, we called it. Um, we were just outside of Buckner Bay, which was close to Aishima, and this Japanese airplane came in, and uh, I'm sure it was looking for a big ship, as you as you mentioned, and it was a very foggy day. And it went around behind us and disappeared. And I happened to be on the radio on the bridge and was conveying messages from the captain down to the gun crews. And f for some reason, I knew where that plane was going to be. And I was watching for it. And sure enough, it, it appeared. And it was. It saw us then and uh, started in its dive well. It was more of a glide because he was already really low. And uh, uh, I immediately, I was the first, I guess, to give the, the message over the phone. And everybody on the on that side of the ship started firing and, and we did knock it down. Um, it got close enough you could see the pilot. And uh, it hit the ground, hit the water, and the engine come flying out and and started skipping like a rock. Um, and I don't know how close it was, but it seemed like it got closer and closer. But that was our experience with uh, with the kamikaze. But uh, they were they were frightening, and they did a lot of damage. They really did. Any time we were. Involved with uh, something serious, we had um, I forget what they called them patrols. I guess we had different patrols at different at different um, positions from from where we were. Um, one patrol might be out 25 miles, and another and out five, and then you know then close in. When the when the kamikazes would come in, they would. The, we would pick them up, maybe there'd be 24 in a group. And then by the time they got to the, to the next patrol, you'd have um, six or eight of them at four apiece, or whatever they happened to be. And then by the time they got further in, they'd split up even more. So you had 24 different airplanes coming from different angles. Maybe eight or 10 would get through the, the the fighters would already have the rest of them. The, it would seem at times that when they got in closer to where we were that every ship was just firing in the air. Well, and it looked like that because you could see the, you could see the guns fire and you could see the tracers and uh, but there were a lot of ships that were that had good gunners, and um, uh, sometimes we would all we would be even be anchored right at Buckner Bay when they'd come in. So you were you know you, you didn't move around much, but we uh, we were able to protect ourselves pretty well. Those of us on the on in the de in the in the bridge crew had two things that was always interesting to us. First of all, 
we usually were close enough that we could see the airplane scramble off of the field. And that would happen almost instantly when the outer patrol has, has discovered them. And the next thing, we could hear the pilots speak between themselves. And um, uh, they, they, everything out there that wasn't your own was a bogey. And uh, these guys would, would intercept uh, a, a group of Japanese, and uh, it was always splash one, you know, splash one bogey. And they were, they were absolutely amazing, and particularly when we got the, the P-51, because they were, they were fast. And the kamikazes were not the zero. They, the, they were fighting a different airplane. And um, they, they really did a fantastic job. When we were further out, like, um, like on the outer patrol, and I don't know how many miles that was, maybe it was 50 miles, but it was way out and it was not good duty. We didn't like it. Um, but we were there uh, as protection for the destroyers as well as you know, we were out there just as eyes and ears, basically. Um, when the flights would come over and they they got close enough to us, I, I mentioned that the gunners on the on the destroyers were so good. Uh, many times I've seen a uh, an air. I'm gonna guess your gesture here, but a, a plane would be coming in and you'd see a you'd see a a burst here and a burst here, and then the next one, it just, it just, he'd just disappear. You know, he'd just go to the water. And uh, the, the, I guess it was two different types of shells that they'd fire. One they would, um, would fire when it got close enough to detect the, sh the plane, I guess. And others, you'd just have a burst at a certain altitude or a certain distance away. But uh, they they were they were sure accurate. They just they could sh shoot down airplanes like crazy. I really got by pretty good in uh, in the military. I really uh, um, I ended up with a little uh, ulcer problem that happened. Uh, um, I don't remember when we went to Ulithia, but um, I think it was just, it, it was right, it was just about the time that the big ships were, were making their excursions uh, and bombarding Japan. They sent a, a, a flotilla of, of ships um, southward. Uh, and we we were actually destined for Ulithia. I don't remember which islands those are in. Maybe the Carolinas. We were uh, doing sonar um, surveillance for this flotilla, and they were all big ships, high speed ships, and our our top speed was like 13 knots. And so they were making us go f full steam and then really were complaining about it. And we were in really high seas, really tough high seas. And we had to go right into the sea. And I got sick for the first, really for the first time. And then I didn't, I didn't feel good aboard ship after that. And that was because of ulcers. We had a um, mascot and it was a Dalmatian dog, and we brought him aboard as a pup. The, the commander one day, uh, the captain one day, brought him aboard, and um, he grew up with us, and um, loved, you know, the, the ship. He was, he was in his element, just like, um, uh, you know, just, just like everybody else. One afternoon, um, while we were sweeping, and I guess we had retired, everybody's busy when you're sweeping mines. I mean, from the captain down, um, 
to even to the guys in the black gang, the guys running the engines, because you're always changing speeds and have to hold exactly the same um, uh, the same uh, speed and the line of travel. So everybody is busy. We retired that night and we missed the dog. The dog is gone. I mean, he, he was gone. And shortly after that, we got a message by. Uh, uh, by light, by signal, uh, asking us if we'd lost a dog. Well, in this group of, of ships was a yard minesweeper. Now, the fantail on a yard minesweeper is about two feet off the water. Three, maybe. Our dog, somewhere or another, got into the water. We don't know how. We suspicion how, but we don't know. And a guy on the ship behind us happened to be this yard minesweeper. He jumped over the board, overboard and swum out to the dog. And of course, the dog was so tired by then, he would have come to anybody. And they threw him a lifeline, and they got the dog aboard their ship. So a day or two later, we, we got the dog back. I just read the other day a, a, a letter. When we had our first reunion, I found the captain. He didn't get to come, uh, uh, but I, we found him, and he wrote me a letter, and he, he, and he gave me an update on the dog. When they decommissioned the ship, he and the chief mechanic, I guess, had to report to California. Uh, another little interesting thing about the dog, they stopped somewhere on, they, they bought a Packard car, I think it was a convertible, and they were headed to California and they stopped somewhere and went into the hotel and the hotel wouldn't accept the dog so they had to leave him in the car in the parking lot. When they got ready to leave the next day, the dog was gone. And so they, they, had, a, they, they had to leave because they had a report date. And as he was driving out of the garage, here was Speck, so they, they, you know, they picked him up and he went on. Eventually, uh, when the captain went on to California and, and, and was in society again, uh, the dog had known nobody but men from the time it was a pup. And uh, it was decided he was a vicious dog, so he had to put him asleep. After Okinawa, um, the thrust of the Pacific War then was toward an invasion of the mainland of Japan. Uh, we, our squadron, um, or many of us anyway, were sent to um, the Philippines for repairs. We'd been out long enough that our evaporators, evaporators, the devices that make fresh water out of seawater uh, were in bad shape. Our engines were in really bad shape. Um, my, sweeping mines is really hard on the engines because you have to maintain a certain speed and you do that by changing the RPMs on the engine constantly. And um, so we were sent to the Philippines. Um, the, a couple of days after we were there, uh, they dropped the first atomic bomb. And um, then I don't know how many days later, two days, three days, then they dropped the second one. The greatest fireworks in the world occurred um, after they dropped the first, after they dropped the second uh, bomb and it was, the, the, and we got the uh, announcement that the war was over. Um, Every ship in that harbor, and there were there were thousands of us there because we were all getting ready to go to Japan, and um, everybody fired everything they had, flare guns, and and you know, it, it was the greatest fireworks you ever saw in your life. And uh, uh, of course, the captain broke out all the beer, you know. And then that, we got through that, and so the officers were breaking out their good booze, and we got through that. And I remember something that's kind of strange, I guess, now. 
my friend and I had bought a gallon of Coca-Cola syrup out of the PX, just plain old Coca-Cola syrup. And if you'd mix it with a little water and a little fruit juice, why that, <laughs> you could get it down. So we sit down behind the, what we call the Aztec hut, which was our station. And uh, we proceeded to drink this while we were watching the fireworks. We were to have like 24 or 30 days to get the repairs done. They, um, they cut us back way, way back because uh, now the war is over or the, you know, it's virtually over and they wanted us to get to Japan. So they, they put us in dry dock. We did, we, we scraped the bottom and we did hurriedly did the repair work and, um, and were to leave there. They sent us to, on, en route to Japan. We got to Okinawa and left and uh, we were in hurricane season. And um, the first hurricane hit us when we were still at, I think we were still at Okinawa. Um, and they would send us to sea then and, and try to, to outrun it and, and get out of its path. Our purpose to going to Japan was to sweep the mines in the harbor so we could get the occupational forces in and get the ships and the stuff that was there. When we went into uh, Nagasaki, the only ship that was there, and they somehow they would got her in, and it was the, the hospital ship Hope. We went into the harbor one day, and the captain asked for his, the small boat, and I happened to be fortunate enough to be on the crew of the little shore, show boat, uh, 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 small boat. I don't know why. Um, I was not part of the crew normally, but I got to go. And um, he wanted to travel up into the harbor. And um, uh, it was uh, interesting to see um, the destruction of, of, of the bomb. There was a, a draw or a canyon that come right down to the ocean. And of course, one of the reasons for dropping it there, this was a submarine base. This is where they made all of the, for a lot of the two-man subs. Um, they had a big shipyard there, and they dropped the bomb just, just off of the shore a little ways. Um, I recall, and now this has been a long time ago. I recall that the. All of the terrain close to the drop site was just charred. Just there was nothing there. There was just you you could see visible things, but there was nothing there. And as you as as your vision would progress up this up this draw or up the hill, um, then. It would go from charred black through a series of colors to a dark brown and a brown. At the bomb site, at the drop site, it was just obliterated. One of the things I remember that stood out in, that stood out in my mind all these years, there was a a large uh, transmission tower, um, series of towers, and they were not just a pole, they were huge uh, tra uh, t towers to hold up many, many uh, lines. Apparently, I don't know whether they were bringing power in for this large um, uh, shipbuilding process or whether they were generating electricity there, I don't know. But they were huge towers and they were tall and they had many electric lines on them. And as you'd proceed up the hill, the, the first ones would be just melted to the ground. I mean, you know, or virtually visible, hardly visible at all. And as you progressed up the hill, um, they would maybe be standing, but they'd be all brown and uh, uh, just like you'd taken a blowtorch and they had just, just, just 
Im impounded into themselves. It was just a mass of, of steel sticking up there. And of course, the, 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 the ground cover just got, uh, you know, went from dark black to clear at the top of the hill uh, to a light tan brown. Everything was just burned up. A group of people would come down to the shore and so the captain would turn, ask the boat to be turned into the shore, and then they just disappear. They just were frightened of us. Uh, eventually, we got up to an area, and we were closer into the beach, and there was a large group of people there, and we did edge into the uh, to the shore, and some of them stayed. It seemed like it was a, a, a half a dozen men or so. And then pretty soon the, the, the girls and the children and the old ladies come. And um, um, as I recall, we offered them cigarettes and this sort of stuff. So that was our, my first contact with any of the Japanese. But it was, uh, of course, before anything was known about, uh, about the, the poisoning that was going to take place later. So that was kind of interesting to see your your very first Japanese people that you'd been uh, hearing about and fighting against all that time. We were alone. I mean, our ship was alone. The 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 beach was just a, a little ways away. Uh, so those of us that wanted to go, um, the captain let us go ashore, and this was just. You know, we had only been in Japan uh, a few weeks, and right after the war, you know. And it, anyway, we landed a little ways from a village and hiked up a hill, and a couple of interesting things happened when we, we were walking through a series of, of little fields and uh, that sort of thing, and uh, then they had some cane fields up there. And we're going along, and we meet this Japanese man. He's a soldier. He's still in his uh, in his uh, clothing. He can't speak English, and we can't speak Japanese, but we talk a little bit. And one of the things he was interested in was the American girl. And um, he could he had a he had a few words of English, as I recall. And I remember one of the things that he did was. Um, American girls like this, Japanese like this. <laughs> and so we talked uh, as best we could for a while, and then he went on, and we're up kind of high on this hillside and walking through these, these little paths between the, the fields and so on, and I remember we come across a kind of a pagoda, I'll say, and there were uh, little gifts and coins and stuff in there, so I remember each of us thought, well, we'll put an American coin in there, you know, and so I don't know what they thought when they found them, but uh, uh, we did that. Well, it's beginning now um, to get later in the afternoon, and we don't know where the hell we are. Um, but we're at the, the, uh, on the side hill now, and we can see this village down there. Well, we knew if we went down, we were going to get to the water, and that was uh, that was where we had to get. And so we started down through these little fields and uh, little rice paddies and, and vegetable gardens is what they were. And you had to go around them. And so we ended up going through what we assumed to be a... Uh, it wouldn't be a cemetery, but a, 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 a was a holy place anyway. And we worked our way through there. I remember we took our hats off and we proceeded through, and we ended up it, it, right in this village. And these Japanese houses are just built one on one side by side and on top of one another. And I recall seeing a a, a guy, uh, apparently it was a barber up on a balcony and he was given haircuts. Uh, funny what you remember. We proceeded on down and had to go right through this village. Now this is just days after, you know, weeks after the, the, the war. 
And of course, we're not too comfortable. We didn't know what they might do to Americans, you know. Probably the first ones they'd ever seen, I'm sure it is. And so we finally work our way down to the water, but this is just a little spit of water that's coming up in here, and we had to, to travel, walk quite a ways down to the dock where the boat could come and get us. And uh, now there's people following us, and there's uh, uh, women, and they've, they've been up picking their gardens and stuff. And so we're trading cigarettes for zucchini and turnips and uh, uh, that sort of thing. And we, we're pretty comfortable there now uh, with, with those people because it was basically all women and, and children. But as we get closer to the dock, there's a group of men down there. And we didn't know what we were coming up against there. But it ended up um, being OK. And uh, it wasn't long until we were, we were late. So the, the little boat was out kind of looking for us. And uh, come into the dock, and we got on the board and proceeded away. But it was really a, a, an uncomfortable, but an experience that I wouldn't give anything for now. You know, it, having having been become that close to him so quickly after being at war with him. You know, it was really unusual. I can't remember where we anchored or where we tied up at night, but we swept around there quite a while. And then we went to some time or another, and I don't know whether it was first or last, but I think we went to Sasebo, and we swept the, the harbor there. And then later, of course, the Japanese had planted uh, mines everywhere, and now they're tickled to death to have us sweep them. And so they opened up their uh, intelligence to us, at least to some extent. Uh, and uh, uh, we're wanting to get their harbors freed of, of this dangerous stuff, too. The trip home was um, pretty uneventful. Um, we, we come back to Hawaii. Uh, that was our first uh, um, encounter again with uh, the kind of society we know. An interesting thing there, the first thing I did was and I was alone that day. We went ashore, and the first thing I wanted was a steak and and grape and uh, pineapple juice. So that's what I did. I went to a hotel, ordered me a steak, and uh, and the guy just kept bringing me pineapple juice and <laughs> and and you know, I'd always liked it, but there in Hawaii, it was you know it was plenty of it. We went through the uh, we went through the canal, Panama Canal. Um, just skirted Cuba and come up into Galveston. We went to Galveston, Texas, and were there for uh, some period of time, uh, just a couple of weeks maybe, and then they sent us up through Inland Canal that goes inland for a ways, and I, I can't think of the name of it, and uh, she went in there for final decommissioning. And that's where I left the ship. I, you know, I don't really know what was happening, what, what all was happening, but I think by then already, they had determined the point system uh, for, for people to get, get out. Uh, didn't make a hell of a lot of difference to us because we were, we were still there. And however, the guys that had the most points uh, were transferred to other ships that were headed for the United States. And so they, we lost some of our guys there, not very many, but, we, but some of them. And uh, of course, was replaced by younger people. Um, I, I had enough points. Um, I can't remember the point system, but you got points for the amount of time, and you got points for each uh, um, 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 what in not invasion, but for each campaign or whatever it was, and and I, um, I was uh, I had received enough points. But at about that time, 
my best friend and I were, he was in sonar too, and we were uh, uh, striking for a higher grade. Uh, if you understand, we were working to, we were third class petty officers, I think, or sec I guess we were second and we're striking for first. Um, just about the time we hit the United States, it was approved. Uh, but we didn't accept it because we didn't want anything to screw up our getting out. So when we was already back home or about home. And so I, uh, I went out, I think, as a second class petty officer and was mustered out in Norman, Oklahoma. And then I hitchhiked from Norman, Oklahoma uh, home, which was in, in, in Grinnell, Kansas. When I arrived in, in Grinnell, I ended up there on a bus, I think. Um, I was in town, and uh, we lived six miles out of town. And I run across a, a neighbor happened to be in town. I asked him for a ride home. I had a dog by the name of Jack, and he always would bark when a car come. That was his job. Uh, this is at night now. Uh, must have been uh, 10 o'clock at night. And um, just east of our house was a, was a little draw. And as we were coming down this uh, into the draw, the lights flashed, and I saw the dog. He was coming to meet me. And he met us there and followed us clear on into the yard and never said a word. He knew, he knew I was in that car. Now, I don't know how. Never let out a bark. I got out of the car and met him and walked to the house, and he never said a thing. You know, it it's absolutely has amazed me ever since. Uh, he'd been a family dog forever. And I mentioned to you that one day I and a friend decided to go enlist and we wanted to go to the Navy. Well, in retrospect, it's hard for me to even conceive what my parents must have thought. What what, you know, and then in those days, it wasn't long, and after you said you're going to go till you go, and the morning that we went into town for me to catch the train, as a matter of fact, I might even have been on the platform of the train, um, my mother in her mind, I'm sure, was wondering, how am I going to know where my son is? And she said to me, when you write a letter, use the first letter of each paragraph to tell me where you are. And then, if you want me to, to look at this, just say hello, to, tell Jack hello. So. I'm sure I have letters um, that she has saved that the first letter of each paragraph would tell her where I was, and all I had to do was say, tell Jack hello, and she knew. So she kept track of me. Isn't that amazing? She kept track of me the whole time, and I kept a damn diary, uh, you know, which was, was probably both course martial offenses, you know, <laughs> but I got away with it. But uh, that's how she knew where I was. It's absolutely out of character for me. Why or how I ever decided to do it, I have no idea. And I think the first entry was when we, when we left Seattle on the shakedown. I'm not positive of that. And I had little lined... Um, pocket notebooks, and, um, and, and I had to keep it small, um, and each night when I'd retire or whenever I got to retire, um, I would try to write uh, uh, about the happenings of, of, of the day, and did that all the way through. I cannot imagine myself doing it. 
but I did, and uh, and my closest friend and bunkmate, so to speak, um, didn't even know I was doing it. I come home, um, and as I recall, went to work. You know, my dad was a farmer. Um, I got home in April or May and uh, went right to helping him. And um, then the next year, uh, he let me have a, a quarter of his land to farm. I made enough to buy a car. When I was in Galveston, I met a man that uh, one of the guys aboard some other ship and he knew what he was going to do. He was going to go to school and learn refrigeration and air conditioning. Apparently had learned some of it aboard ship. And that interested me. And um, it was, I was home for a year and a half or so. And uh, Don and I got married on the 27th of July. And about the 1st of August we left and I went to Okmulgee, Oklahoma to Oklahoma A&M Tech had taken over a, a prison camp in Okmulgee and made a, a technical school out of it. And so I, we went there and I studied refrigeration air conditioning. Her uncle invited us to uh, uh, come to his place in, uh, um, what was the name of the town, Donna? Anyway, Emporia, Kansas. And um, um, I, I was helping him as a salesman for, for uh, air conditioning and heating. Then he helped us set up a company in, uh, in Hastings, Nebraska. And so that summer I sold air conditioning and, and heating on the road. But we were newly married and I would be away all week long and we didn't like that. So we went back to Kansas and um, did odd jobs around and then we started a, uh, I rented a, uh, a building and we were running, a, a set up a roller rink and was running dances and, and working on the farm and we were working for her dad. And then eventually we, uh, we bought a ranch in 1950 and uh, uh, we had, uh, we were running. Uh, uh, we were running about seventeen hundred and sixty acres or so, and then um, uh, we were we had we just had had two children, and uh, we bought in nineteen fifty, and a drought hit that spring, and we survived it for seven years, and finally decided it was best that we just sell out and end up at least free and clear and and I come to Denver then and got a job uh, in refrigeration uh, maintenance and that's how we got to Denver. I worked for just for an independent man to just a, a, a growthies refrigeration. Then I went over and worked for I got a job as a building mechanic in the brand new public service building. As a matter of fact I went to work there before the contractor turned it over to us and uh, then I went out to Rocky Mountain Arsenal as a refrigeration mechanic, worked there out of the electrical shop and then moved over to the safety office and started there as an inspector and retired there as the director of the office. I have two children. They were uh, real young when we come here. One was born in 1951 and the other in 54. My daughter is the oldest. Uh, she now lives in uh, Albuquerque, uh, has uh, one son that's 10 years old. Uh, she's just now finishing um, uh, her master's degree. Um, in some form of education uh, and uh, <clears throat> uh, her and her husband live in, live in uh, Albuquerque. What's, their, what's her, name? her name? Her name is Chris T, uh, two words, C-H-R-I-S-T-E-E. -E. 
and her last name now is Weichselman. Um, she married um, a fellow by the name of Joseph Weichselman, who ironically is just finishing up his doctorate. So they're very educated minded. Uh, he, by the way, is uh, uh, employed by the Forest Service, uh, and right now he's at Mesa Verde as one of the uh, rangers there. Our son um, now is at Colorado Springs. He is one of the coaches to the men's uh, national volleyball team, the Olympic team. And that's a new job for him. He uh, has, has just come back from Australia, having been the, the Australian ladies uh, Olympic coach in volleyball and went to the Olympics in Sydney and uh, after the Olympics he elected to come back to the United States and uh, was selected for one of the coaches uh, for the one of the assistant coaches here so yeah and before that he was at CU as uh, as a coach he started that um, he started the program in uh, uh, I believe it was 1986 when it was determined that, that the university needed to get some ladies athletics so volleyball was one of them and they didn't at the time he was uh, the head coach at, Reg at Regis and at the time he was uh, hired they didn't have a volleyball or a net so he was borrowing those things from Regis and I was building him things to let the girls practice on, and uh, and so he built that up to uh, a winning team, and they're still doing fine. We were living in Wheat Ridge all those years. Uh, we came here in '57, and uh, then we moved and went to Littleton for 11 years, and we come in Broomfield in 1992, and this is where we'll stay. I had mixed emotions. Um, my opinion was it was going to cost all of us something, uh, take something out of our pocket, and I'm sure that's going to be the case. But I think, again, if we can keep our city and county management in tow, I think we're going to be far better off because we're going to have our own you know, we, we'll have our own support. We don't have to depend on three other counties for, for what we need. I think it's a good deal. We've actually been pretty fortunate, I think, in having the people aboard that we did to, to drive this thing. I think it's, I think, I, I think it's going to work out fine. And I, I think with the, with the increase uh, in revenue from from um, the mall and, and every, I, th I think we're going to do really great. You know, there's two sides of the coin. When we first come here, you could go to the grocery store and pick up your groceries, or you'd go to the, you could go to the post office and walk right up to the counter. Well, you lose some of that. But, you know, we've got more money to do things with in this city now than, than most cities ever have, and if we do it right, we ought to have a really great community, if greater than it is now. We've been having uh, uh, ship reunions in the last few years, and uh, it's it's amazing. Those of us that come, there's some of us that still haven't decided that it was a good deal. I guess um, the the guys are uh, it, it it's just they've, they've really renewed a, a great friendship. And it's strange to us to to watch the the, the ladies because um, you'd swear that they'd known each other for for years. It it yeah they really did have fond relationship. On our second reunion, it was the the machinist aboard ship lived in Seattle. Well, he was then living. He, well, he lived in Moses Lake, Washington. He was uh, some. He had gotten to be some sort of an authority on 
um, water and dams and this sort of thing, which they have a lot of up in that area. And he went to a seminar in Seattle. And um, one of the days, um, they give them an excursion in a, in a port there in, in Seattle. And he's sitting beside this man. And this guy says, oh, look, there's a ship just like mine. And he was pointing out this yard minesweeper. And um, Dean says, yeah, oh, yeah, which one? There's hundreds of them out there. And he says, well, that yard minesweeper. And um, so Dean says, oh, you were on a minesweeper too. And so they get to talking. And, and pretty soon this guy says, you know, a funny thing happened when we were in the East China Sea. Um, I don't know. A, a dog fell off of a minesweeper in front of us, and uh, I swum out and uh, and got the dog and 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 brought it back to the ship. And here, these two guys both lived in Moses Lake, Washington, which is a little community. Had been there all of the time from from the time they got out of service and didn't know each other, and met on this little excursion. <laughs> And this guy was telling us about the dog. And so they, uh, they invited him to our reunion there at Moses Lake. And so we got to meet him. But how small a world it is. <laughs>